Welcome back to the Green Rush Live podcast. I'm going to be your host today. I'm Josh Kincaid. I'm with the Talking Hedge. The Green Rush Live brought to you every Friday by Pro Cannabis Media between 4 and 6 Eastern. With me, we got Christopher Smith of American Cannabis Report. Christopher, thanks for being with us as always. My pleasure, Josh. How are you doing today? That's great. I'm in Seattle. It's not raining. No complaints. Uh, looks like we're on, the, we're on the West Coast today. Uh, there's three of us right here. We've got Robert Lurie with Ablusum Law. He's an attorney up in Vancouver, BC, running around like a madman all over the U.S. Here to talk to us about uh, a little bit about home grow throughout North America. Rob, thanks for being with us at Green Rush. Josh and Christopher, thanks for having me. And Dan, good to see you all. And yeah, we got a bit of a West Coast thing going here, which has been is fabulous because for the last three weeks, um, I was in Dallas, uh, Denver, Colorado, New Mexico, in or Las Vegas, New Mexico, back to Denver, a wedding at a conference in the interior of British Columbia, and then Mexico City. So I got to tell you, that was three oh. weeks away from the West Coast. And now being back on the West Coast, we can get down to it today. So thanks for having me, gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Um, you know, I guess we can start with, uh, let's start with, with Washington home grow because it's a felony up here, which kind of puts us in a, in a unique position where there's such a harsh rule against it. Um, so there is uh, the house bill 1019 in Washington. They're trying to get about 10 plants, but in the meantime, if you don't have a medical card, it's a felony to grow. So if you have a medical card, you can grow and they're trying to kind of just match that with a home grow plan. And there's, you know, hemming and hawing going on. So the industry thinks it's going to be competition. They don't want it. There's ancillary businesses who think that the picks and shovels could be opportunities. There's people on both sides who have opinions, of, of course. Uh, but ultimately, I don't really think any law should be a felony, no matter what, as it pertains to cannabis. So that's my, my opinion. Washington, this Petri dish experiment can kind of continues to, uh, you know, amaze me. By, by the rules, regulations, and everything, but that's what it is in, in Washington. Um, Christopher, you got any uh, anything on, on California and what's going on down there? There's always great stuff coming out of Cali. Well, sometimes there's great stuff coming out of Cali. Down here, um, if you are 21 and older, you can grow six plants at home. And if you are 18 and a medical patient and you have a prescription or from your doctor, then you can grow also, but it's six plants still. Um, I've always been um, puzzled by this sort of the, the draconian nature of shutting down home grow, you know, with the big hammer, especially in your case, as you're talking about in Washington, where it still remains a felony. Um, I don't understand, as a practical matter, I don't believe that home grow really threatens re retail. It doesn't threaten the professional growing community, really. If I can grow six plants for my own use, I, I, I'm one client, one customer. I just don't see how the threat is so massive that the state has to come down so hard. I think that it's, I just think it's, it's I, I think it's very, very Voldemort, uh, very dark and, uh, and, and sort of, and unbalanced really. And I think you're right. I, I would agree with you that it needs to be rolled back and, and rationalized so that it just makes sense with people's uh, everyday lives. It's fairly draconian. Even, you know, we used to have in Washington, you could have up to three caregivers. So you could grow five plants. And then if you are, excuse me, 15 plants. And then if you had three other people, you could grow a total for uh, 45 plants medical. So that was, I feel like that was kind of, you know, liberal. Now they kind of just went the opposite way. And that's probably yeah. because of lobbyists on, on that side of some of these licensee you know, holders. Um, and that's kind of where we're at. So we kind of have to, to fight that. Um, Robert, what's, I, I'm not even sure what the deal is with, with home grow. Is that, was that written into the legalization? Can you yeah. grow legally? There's a lot of points we can talk about home grow here. Um, maybe let me just go back to slightly a bit of the beginning of the story so we can segue into what the current state of affairs is. But yeah, Canada became licensed uh, under the MMAR, which was the Medical Marijuana Access Regs, back in about 2011 or so, 2010, 2011, more or less, which, again, enabled people to grow 
you know, a certain amount of recommended cannabis under the medical program. And at this time, you know, you ended up seeing there were doctors like legendary. You'd hear stories of, you know, doctors signing scripts for $15,000 for these crazy amount of plant counts, as it was known. But ultimately, the home grow, uh, they tried to eliminate that. That was the Harper government with the MMPR, medical marijuana purpose regs, in about 2013 or so. And they, there was a group of lawyers in the Allard case that brought an injunction, effectively enabling these medical patients to keep growing while the case made its way ultimately to the... Um, yeah, it was at federal court of first instance for the Aller case and Smith, which dealt with edibles and access medical patients accessing cannabis in all its forms was at the Supreme Court level. So effectively, these two court cases prevented more or less the government for ending home grow. Uh, medical patients now can continue to grow or have their cannabis grown by a designated producer. Or, of course, you can access that through the licensed producer system uh, for medical patients. And then, at you know, default, there's also recreational access. But for home grow, uh, four plants is the magic number that anyone can legally grow in Canada without any real stipulation. However, you know, if your grow is within a direct sight line of like schools and children and neighbors and a bunch of other stuff that doesn't apply to cucumbers, tomatoes, or apples, uh, but applies to cannabis nonetheless, uh, you can still grow four. That's outdoor growing. Indoor growing, of course, uh, you don't have the same visibility issues. Um, but again, it's relatively easy, I would say, you know, to, if, you know, if you really want to look hard enough and go the direction, you know, to become licensed to grow plants. Myself, I have a, a total of 50 gram a day uh, authorization to possess, of which 30 of that I can grow, which when you type in the numbers into the Health Canada calculator, roughly I could grow 250 plants if I wanted to. And I mean, that's a good number because at the end of the day, you know, it's not just medical production for like site, you know, high bulk THC distillate at the end of the day, you know, people very, very well be wanting non psychoactive CBD. And if you're going to be producing your own oil four plants, ain't going to cut it. I mean, as it says in the Bible, you need one pound of a seed bearing plant known as cannabism, the Hebrew name from cannabis to make ultimately one ounce of a oil with with the benefits so that's what's going on with home growing and before i just conclude that allard case should have been definitive but we have two provinces in canada manitoba and quebec where their provincial governments have been trying to ban home grow and that's going to be going before the courts um later this year but the arguments in allard for why medical patients couldn't possibly grow their own cannabis which was disputed beyond uh, beyond the balance of probabilities was the fact that fire, crime, and mold could not, on their own, justify an absolute prohibition against banning. So we'll see what happens. But from my view, that's a constitutionally protected activity, and the governments of Manitoba and Quebec are late to the party and didn't get the memo, and uh, we'll probably get their ass handed to them um with that litigation so we'll see hope hope that's a good enough answer yeah it is and yet so you only can grow four plants at home washington can only grow 10 california i mean six, six. so and none Italy's of that, looking at six too sorry for jumping in there yeah and it, it kind of seems like all of these places are are kind of copying one another staying within kind of the same realm or whatnot and yet that doesn't seem enough to um do anything of consequence right yeah so so outdoor grow you're maybe gonna get maybe an out look i've mm -hmm. asked a lot of clients that you know are regarded as master growers within pretty elite circles and, you know, you, you're looking on average at maybe an ounce of dry bud, right, from an outdoor plant, unless you're jacking it with 
some unique nutrient cycle and, and combination with other factors. So ultimately, you know, four plants outdoor uh, in some regards uh, may not yield much. But on the other hand, I have another client who from four plants is growing a ridiculous amount of cannabis you know, in Saskatchewan outdoor with that. And, you know, he'd be a good guest for you to have in future. But yeah, it's very different. Indoor and outdoor is like not even ba- baseball and softball. They're so different. Rob, you said an ounce. Did you mean a pound? One pound? Um, well, no, actually in an in outdoor, indoor, you could pull one to three pounds depending on per light. But I've heard that, you know, again, the average grower that's going to grow four plants in a home outdoor setting, you might be looking at an ounce to possibly a a, a pound. Wow. That sounds really, uh, that doesn't sound worth it. (laughs) But it's closer to the ounce level is my understanding. Again, like in the last few years, there's been some changes and advances in outdoor cultivation, but uh, you're also limited to size. And I mean, growing these big mammoth monster (laughs) plants right again might fall afoul of your neighbors seeing this and then them phoning the police or making a complaint with a municipality and chances are they probably aren't going to make it a priority you know three years into legalization but if they want to make your life difficult that's the low-hanging fruit no pun intended uh to invite them in yeah i would think that a lot of the viewers and listeners to the show could maybe grow some of those, those monstrous plants, but the average person will probably fail at it. And so they'll make some money at these pick and shovel businesses that pop up. Like in Seattle, they were all over. These warehouses were all over the place and you could go and get all these different things. And then regulation kicked in and all of those warehouses are gone now. So anybody who kind of came in thinking that that would stick around for a while, they realize that you could try and grow, but you're going to fail. And then you're just going to go right to the store. You don't see people rolling their own cigarettes. You don't see people making their own liquor and you're not going to find people growing your own cannabis. Well, I don't know. It depends on what circles you're hanging out with. But no, I agree with you, Josh, uh, with that. But the price of legal cannabis, and I really want to hear what Christopher has to say about California but I went into some legal stores in the last few weeks and holy crow, you can buy a ounce of semi-decent like trailer park boys brand cannabis, big bag of buds from Organogram for about a hundred bucks before taxes. And I mean, that's not bad at all. Right. But that grower apparently or producer is maybe making 30 to 50 bucks on that ounce when in the black market, that same ounce could probably easily go from anywhere from a hundred bucks as high as 150, right? Um, good quality, but that producer in the black market is going to be realizing, you know, in excess of 75% of the cost or recoup that, whereas the producer plus cannabis is you know, there's many substitutes. Brand loyalty is a dream in this business. So ultimately, good news for consumers, bad news for producers. But ultimately, this is where I think the power balance is going to shift back to the lower scale, higher quality craft producer, which will be able to realize sweet spot margins that these large behemoths that are just burning resources, pissing electricity and, uh, you know, mismanaging water are going to be in trouble because those commodities are only going to get more expensive and harder to get licensed for just due to scarcity principle as we advance into the future. So, you know, Chris, what are you seeing in California? Are prices in the legal market and illegal markets dropping like in Canada and quality going up? I would say, well, to the first part, the price part, for sure. Um, prices, you know, the, the legend is, you know, we've all heard here is, you know, it used to be that cannabis was about $4,000 a pound. Now it's about $600 a pound. So okay. it, it's really a slaughter kind of thing. And, and in California is particularly our problem. And I've said this many times, but our problem here is they allow too many growers and not enough retailers. So we have all the supply and a really, really tight sort of uh, pinch point at the retail uh, and so 
the you know the growers are getting are getting creamed and the bigger growers who have more money and more capital behind them are able to kind of weather the storm the smaller people are getting creamed and also are uh you know really really sort of looking at the illicit market going i don't know it's looking maybe a little more decent over there you know i mean they they're like you said much more masters of their own destiny over on that side but on the, on the home grow side, again, I, I think another issue is we, we talk about this in terms of economics, but then there's another whole issue of uh, caregivers. And I think Josh sort of alluded to this about caregivers, right, where, you know, caregivers are growing a small number of plants to help serve their clients, uh, you know, serve their medical patients. And many of those patients can't even get out of the house to go and go to a dispensary and go shop or whatever. You know, they're, cons they're restricted in their movements because of their illness or their condition. So this whole draconian approach toward home growing and shutting it down is really, really having a negative effect on patients. And what worries me so much is, especially with patients, they have so little voice, you know, they don't get heard when these legislations are, are created and sort of ran through. Well, the patients don't get heard, you know, so these people are suffering and then they have this sort of maybe cannabis, you know, panacea sort of, uh, you know, dangled over their head. But then it's pulled back. Either it's a felony in Washington or, uh, you know, the, the market gets kind of mushed around. Uh, so it's it's a real it's a real negative, I think, for uh, for patients. It's to, to me, that's one of the big problems. Well, that's where we, we fought. Like I was involved with a group of lawyers and we sued three levels of government. At one point, I think I represented close to 30, 40% of the unlicensed illicit dispensaries once the city of Vancouver decided to regulate. So, I mean, I was totally out of the closet as a cannabis lawyer the day that the city of Vancouver tried to regulate something that the federal government was saying, "Uh, uh hold on a minute now. Um, but, you know, we ended up challenging effectively the, the government system that it could not provide for medical patients. And in fact, under the Canadian medical access system, you have to have had or have a fixed address and a credit card effectively in order to buy weed online and, and participate in that which meant that if you were homeless, which a lot of the dispensaries were providing compassionate access, you know, you'd have literally the under $5 gram of pretty decent product that, you know, would be given or sold under compassionate access. And really there, there is no brick and mortar access for, for medical cannabis in Canada. Mm -hmm. You got to go through this very strange process of ordering online and pickup and delivery and mail sure. order which is very strange and so for medical patients it will be wonderful in Canada when we start to see more brick and mortar access because that's how you buy everything else for goodness sakes yeah well you know a very similar thing happened in here in California um in 19 uh what is it, 96, whatever, 25 years ago, um, we had a thing called Proposition 215, which was the Medical Cannabis Act. That's the first one that kind of, you know, knocked the dominoes and sort of set the whole thing moving forward. So that's that's almost 30 years ago at this point. Uh, and uh, 20 years after that, we had uh, Prop 64. Prop 64 had one particular uh, 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 portion or component to it that made things really, really difficult, which is that there's this thing in California called the League of Cities, which um, seems to be very much sort of a, to me, very much a, a, a reefer madness kind of mom group who, uh, what they were standing up for the rights of the cities to opt out of cannabis. And so what happened was a lot of medical dispensaries got knocked out because if a, if a town said, we don't want any cannabis, well, now there wasn't any medical either. So the patients really got it. And the, and the problem was, of course, they didn't have enough representation when the legislation was made, so they got waxed. And not only can they do they not have brick and mortar in their town, but um, in many times they don't have a, a delivery either. Well, Just doesn't recently, that open the door, that, though, to organized crime and absolutely. gangs of course to it fill did. that void that the municipality has now created? Of course it did. But the, so the League of Cities thinks that they're sort of controlling cannabis and kind of keeping it out of our town. But of course, that's the opposite of what happens. It's completely the opposite. 
there's still the guy who's out by the dumpster who's still going to sell to whoever, including your kids, because he doesn't take ID. He doesn't give a shit. He doesn't care. Right. So whenever you don't have a legal regulated market in your town, then it's, you know, it's it's free, uh, you know, free access for the illicit market. So that's one thing. Um, just recently, uh, a, a new bill is going through Congress to try to make sure that all of the towns in California have at least delivery access. So hopefully that's going to be successful. But here's one of the things that happens, and I think it's sort of similar to what you were saying, Rob, which was there's a town in Northern California, Walnut Creek, nice little sort of feeder community into San Francisco, very, uh, you know, sort of upscale uh, community, Walnut Creek is. Um, they opted out of, uh, of having any cannabis businesses in town. There's one local business that's allowed to serve medical patients in Walnut Creek, but like you said, only with a residential address. So if you're at work and you need something, you can't get it. If you're in a hotel because you've come to visit town, for example, nope, no, can't do it. However, all the other delivery companies in the towns around Walnut Creek do not have that regulation. So the only one who gets it, who suffers, is the one local business who's operated and licensed in town, but they can't do this. And so patients are getting their cannabis from as far away as Sacramento, which is an hour away. <laughs> so now, I mean, if you just sort of picture how ludicrous it is, right? A person gets in the car, drives, gasoline, pollution, all of that, you know, risk of accident, everything, has to drive all the way across the state, all the way to Walnut Creek to give somebody their, their cannabis that they bought when there's a local solution that could do it, right? So all of this is very similar. It's all very similarly, I think, wrapped around the same issue of local control, of patients being able to so be in control of their own destiny, of caregivers having access to medicine, to be able to deliver it to cannabis patients when they need it. All of these things are all wrapped up together, and I don't think we're out of the woods at all. We are out of time with this segment, though. We're going to have to take a commercial break for our mandatory 420 commercial break. Rob, are you able to stick right. around for the next segment or you got to go? No, I'm here. I'm All here. right, so we're not going to kick Rob off. We're going to take a quick right. break. We are here for a two hours live. We're going to be here another hour and a half. So don't, don't go anywhere. Stay right here with uh, Green Rush Live. Welcome back to the Green Rush Live podcast. I'm your host today, Josh Kincaid from the Talking Hedge. Jimmy's still stuck in line. He didn't he didn't order it online, so he's going to be there for a while at the store. Uh, Christopher <laughs> Smith, he is with the American Cannabis Report. I'm back with us also is Robert Laurie, a Vancouver, BC based attorney with Adlusum Law. Fellas, thanks for being back with us at Green Rush Live. Thank you, Josh. So we're talking about home grow, had a decent conversation in the first segment, kind of wanted to touch base a little bit more on that because we were talking about delivery and how that's an option for, you know, caregivers. I personally stopped growing for my friend who had since passed away from multiple sclerosis once the wholesale level reached about $3 a gram, because that was how much I was paying in utilities was around $3 a gram. So for me, I kind of, that was my point for stopping. And then looking now at the retail level at $30 on everyday low prices for kind of outdoor flower, um, you, you know, I got that for $21 on 420. So the, the, growers may be selling that for 10 bucks per ounce. So I'm not really sure how anybody in the illicit market is going to compete with that. We kind of were talking about that whole competition aspect in the first segment. But when I've been doing 20 stores on 420 for the last six years, I've noticed a couple of different things. One is that the sales you see on 420 are the everyday low price two years later. Um, and that the majority of people still like flour at least two thirds to three quarters of all bud tenders, you know, upwards of 90%, depending on the year, all like flour and the number one product being sold is consistently flour. And yet we're seeing California where it's only 40%. A lot of those individuals won't be able to make the products, the vape pens that Robert showed us in the first segment. Uh, they're not going to be able to make edibles that have that's uh, homogenous and, and uniform from every bite. They're not going to be able to make processed goods in the same way and at scale for that price. So at some point, maybe you can grow flour, but if, if Robert's suggestion or, or expectation of a one ounce per plant, that's a terrible 
yield if you can only grow 10 in Washington or six in California or four in Canada, that is not enough for anybody to get by because I can burn through 28 grams in six days, you know, on a slow week. <laughs> so it's not really enough for most people. Well, the state has come down so hard on the, the state, I think, generally. I mean, United States, really, even also, you know, but the state comes down very hard on the home grow. I found uh, an interesting thing. I may have mentioned this before, but, um, you know, previous life, I was working uh, in sort of the sustainability area. And um, one of my clients was in, uh, call it water reclamation or rainwater reclamation. The idea wow. being, since we're in such a drought here in California, that if you can capture the rainwater that comes off your roof when there are storms here and, and capture that water and, and, uh, and save it and preserve it, um, then you'll have more water. You won't need as much water from the city utilities, et cetera. But what I learned was that in many places, many uh, jurisdictions, saving your own water is illegal. Mm -hmm. And then I learned further, just sort of doing research that there have been during history, different times where growing your own vegetables is not legal. So I, I think that this home growth thing falls in that category of the government wanting to make sure that they get a little tax on every single thing you do. Well, that's and, so and, interesting. Oh, sorry. And that greed, that greed is really hurting people, I think, in our cannabis industry. Sorry to jump in like that, Christopher. Um, but it's interesting, the example, let's take it even at a high, like at a different level, but look at Gandhi. The whole passive nonviolence uh, approach to to effectively protest, right? And what was so interesting was one of the first big, I guess, events that Gandhi in his mm -hmm. in his in his brilliant history was. He said that I'm going to walk for four days to the coast and I will make salt without right. paying a salt tax and. He started his walk and people gathered and followed him all the way to the sea. And he began on the shoreline with a process with the salt water, making salt and not uh, paying the tax. Then he took it right. forward further with the whole homespun movement. Like, why are we importing cloth and paying tax and all this? We should be spinning our own clothes. So I think it's brilliant to see that people are looking at cannabis with some of these similar uh, themes of self-sustainability, self-reliance. And at the end of the day, you know, I think government forgot who they worked for a long time ago. And if a no, government, no. that's what scared me about the Cannabis Act, because ultimately, if you read that, it's like, if you don't get your phytocannabinoids from us, you're going to jail. If you don't get your food from us, you're going to jail. If your oxygen isn't regulated and purchased from us, you're going to jail. Like it's a slippery slope of where uh, government overreach with regards to the access and taxing of basic necessities is going to have to be readdressed or it'll just lead to a proliferating underground market as it does for any of uh, any, any contraband where there's a demand. Sure, sure, absolutely. You know, we talked a little bit about um, the disadvantages of trying to grow. It's not easy. You're not going to yield much. And yet every time I go up to Vancouver, BC, I always smell the funkiest, some of the best grown cannabis. I've talked about on this uh, podcast as well, that in Seattle on Third Avenue at this bus stop across from the courthouse, best smelling cannabis every single time, no matter what. <laughs> all of the people that go and congregate right there, all these locals have some of the best stuff. And I've been asking why. I interviewed a guy who did vertical uh, agriculture with cannabis, and he was talking about, you know, ah, premium and, and really good terpenes and flavonoids and everything and asking him, well, how are you able to do that on a large scale? Because it seems like all of the craft growers are the ones that have the funkiest skunk, you know, the smell, the terpene, everything that you actually really want. So there's, there's still kind of this, uh, this debate on, on is it small? craft grows that can really only grow the best, funkiest, uh, best smelling uh, versus large? Is it only going to be home grows? Or Competency of the grower. Competency of the grower. Because I think it's really one of those yeah. things that that's not how they determine licenses. It really should be dependent on how large or how small to hit a standard or a, or a quality. And 
you know, look, that it's a tough question because it's like, how long is a piece of string, right? But you need to really look at all the different variables and factors. But to me, I think it's how much, like when you look at large scale vertically integrated farms, they're technically like a micro scale that's just being replicated. And to me though, are you still able with all that AI to maintain a connection with the plant and to, again, finish that to a point where the process and the maturity of the plant ends up equating to what you're saying, that funky, the funky smell and that experience. And again, I think it's possible to do on a very large scale, but the problem is, is, you know, corners get cut and the large scale weed, like I used to joke and say, yeah, it'll be fun one day to go into a gas station and buy a pack of Tilray blue labels or whatever. Right. But you know, who's really going to want that? You're going to get that pack of blue labels at the gas station you know, if that's all you can get, but it's no substitute for something that you would buy at a farmer's market or at a small intimate gathering where people are able to demonstrate their wares without too much restriction. So anyway, what do you think, Chris, Christopher? Well, I think it's, uh, there maybe this is the dividing line though. You know, uh, there's a, there's a, another bill in California just on the very topic you're talking about, which is going to uh, farmers markets, but their licensed growers are going to be able to go to farmers markets. And, and the idea is that they won't be pinched by the retail. They will have an additional avenue for themselves, but these are the licensed growers, not, not home growers. But they, right. they have that in Canada, too. They, we're going to be start seeing in British Columbia. Actually, there's been one or two in Ontario and I think the first in B.C., but it's called the farm gate model. OK. And so when you come up to Kelowna or the interior of British Columbia into the beautiful wine country, you go to these like billion dollar wineries that some of them just look like new age cult headquarters. They're they're so swish. But yeah. That's where you're starting to see that, you know, again, that wine over the last 25 years has been allowed to be sold out of a winery and a certain percentage of the overall business you can sell out of brick and mortar retail under an ancillary an ancillary sales license. And so the right. fun thing is, is we're starting to see that with cannabis. And I mean, how cool will it be to be able to go to certain different regions and like talk about water and pH and soil sure. and uh, be able to try different things. Cause you see the wine people go on about it and it's just, but with yeah. cannabis, that's something that, I mean, I'll be really excited to get down to. So oh, do I agree. I, I agree with you so much. Do you think it's just going to be an ingredient then? Like if you look at beer, like when you talk about beer makers, none of them actually grow it. They all get their hops from the Yakima Valley here in Washington state. And then they grow or they, they brew their, their home brew from that. They don't actually grow all their ingredients. So do you think it'll be something where they just buy the cannabis and then they, I don't know, roll their cigarettes with it? Or do you think it's actually going to be an agricultural thing? And so that's question number one. And what's the market share that they're going to grab? Oh, man. Christopher, help me out, buddy. Well, I know, uh, again, I mean, we started with uh, the, the concept of home grow. I think the different licensing, it, it probably was designed to set up a system where certain people grow, certain people process, certain people sell, and, and it would kind of, uh, you know, segment off those kind of skill sets. So I suppose as as the cannabis industry gets bigger and bigger, then uh, the, uh, those efficiencies will start to, uh, you know, manifest, I guess, that's kind of the main idea. Um, but again, back to the, you know, the idea of the very small growers growing at home, uh, I just, you know, I, I just hope that all of this process toward big scale, big industrial stuff that's, you know, we, we know that big ag is coming, big pharma is coming, big alcohol is coming, they're already here, you know, we know that they're all have, designs on cannabis, but the the people that grow at home, whether they want to grow for their own personal use, like you were talking about really skilled craft growers who may just want to grow their own, should be allowed to do it. Mm -hmm. they, they have a very, very tiny impact on this overall market. They should be yeah. allowed to do that. 
And certainly patients and their caregivers should be allowed to do that because the, it's, it's just an infinitesimal impact on this big economic machine. Mm-hmm. Let certain that that small fraction of the population that are able to grow cannabis, which is, you know, not, you know, it's not easy, right? It's not like you just sort of like put the daisies in the ground and up they come. It's, it's, it's very complicated, very labor intensive. So yeah, you can get something, right? Just literally throwing the seeds and hopefully they 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 do it their thing. But it's yeah. to, to finish a product, to guard it, care for it, and sure. properly cure it, finish it. There's there's an art and there's skill in that, which um right. a lot of the big corporations are finding out or learning the hard way due to the fact that they've tried to scale and replicate something that really hasn't been tested and you know, sure. I use the the analogy of I'm pretty good on the barbecue, but if I had to make ribs now for 500 people, let alone 5,000 people, you know, that's going to end up a bit of a dog's breakfast without completely reestablishing the protocols, the steps and the procedure to get to that outcome without it being a complete dog's breakfast or a crapshoot. Absolutely. Especially if w- your starting point is a cow who's like right over there. And your job is you got to turn that cow into barbecue, right? Now, all all of a sudden, now it's a whole different game, right? So it's the same idea really with with cannabis growing at home, right? There are very few people who are going to be able to actually do all of the complicated procedures like you just talked about, and then go to market with it. I mean, you know, it's, it's absolutely tiny. So I just think that the government needs to stop focusing on this. It seems to me that a big part of it is there, as Josh said in the very beginning of the show, uh, it's that sort of, or you might have said it, Rob, they, they forgot who they work for. I think that was you, Rob. You got that look on your face. <laughs> well, but again, it's, you know, that's you got this lobby in Canada that literally are made up of like hedge fund money. And that are effectively trying to regulate cannabis in a way that might, you know, they thought it was going to work for them. But I mean, Canopy just posted two days ago that they've had to lay off 250 like employees to save $150 million. And so while they're kind of jerking around, figuring out, you know, what makes money and what doesn't, that's where I really see that a lot of these big megaliths that where big stock plays are going to, you know, be relegated to the shipyards of history, which will be replaced by these smaller, nimble brands that, again, have a connection, but more importantly, a story. And that's where I think the farm game model will do well, because if the weed is good and there's a story and you're more likely than to visit or again, establish a brand connection due to the connection with the land. And to me, that is where I think a lot of the government is missing the short sightedness or they're short sighted and missing the bigger picture in that, you know, there's tons of industry that could come from the home growing or, you know, the you grow model as it was called and these communal methods of where people could be able to produce a certain amount and again that's no real threat to the larger established players but you get enough of them which is what's happening in Canada and uh, they're going to have to totally revisit the system because the largest impediment to the legal market is the black market and the biggest consideration fueling that is of course the medical grow uh, and the access to grow through through the medical avenue. And so just to tie this back into our topic of home grow, that is where I can see this lobby going after next and putting the medical patients in the crosshairs, because despite there being legitimate medical need, that avenue has been exploited by organized crime and 50 shades of whatever you want to call it, gray, black, or, or, or green, um, which is, again, undercutting the market. So the government's going to have to be realistic with inviting and including facets of the market. So you end up with what's happening in Mexico, apparently, which cartels are moving into avocados. But to me, that's the biggest problem facing the Mexican legal industry is 
they're going to have to involve the cartels and bring them off the grid and onto the grid with regard to cannabis for it to work. So it'll be interesting to watch because if you don't get it right, or eradicate your competition, then you'll be beaten by it. And that that's what's happening in Canada. That's another funny thing that happens with the legislators where it, it early on, I remember reading this many, many times where if you had a record, uh, if you had a felony record, for example, you were banned from the cannabis business. If you had been arrested for growing before you were banned from the business. Well, that was banning the talent from the game, which was, 100%. completely illogical, right? These are people who have been growing and know how, why would you keep them out of the business? Unless, unless well, you have a different goal, right? Unless you have a like, different name. It's like the Harlem Globetrotters, not right. inviting NBA all-star players to all-star weekend. That's how I used to look at it. You it's know, exactly the legal right. markets, the Globetrotters, and they exist because, well, the NBA isn't allowed to yeah. play in the league. Yeah. But but home grow is such to me, it, it, home grow is such a human level. It's so it's such a, an issue of kind of just common humanity. It's not an issue of economics. It's not it's an issue America of America like, was founded. Right. I mean, that's the founding yeah. fathers, all that kind of cool propaganda we hear up in Canada about the founding fathers, you know, growing fields of hemp and being self-sustainable and um, you know, no right. right to taxation without representation, but it's almost like 200 and something years later, you know, we've forgotten this and we're allowing government overreach and encroachment to the point that we're tolerating laws that say you can't grow your own vegetables. You can't, right. you know, you can't have a cow co-op. I used to have a paralegal that they were in a cow co-op because they all wanted unhomogenized milk like you can get in France. And literally Health Canada showed up and like took the cow, right? And it's like, really, what kind of a threat is this to anyone other than the dairy industry? The they FDA showed up with it. They want all of it. Yeah, the FDA showed up with, with rifles and machine guns to farms for the same reason. I'm looking at you know, home grow with the long-term view, like how, how does it become sustainable? And the only way I'm hearing throughout this you know, hour-long conversation is if the price dumps dramatically to replicate what the organ market is growing through, which only has half the licenses that Oklahoma has at 3,500, but the prices for ounces are like $19, meaning at a wholesale level, you're looking at around six and a half bucks. So if or when we have global legalization and you have Peru and Colombia and Chile coming in at 15 cents per gram and a buck 30 in the US and six in Canada, there's going to be shifts dramatically. Well, and that includes home grow too. But how do you keep home grow uh, above the illicit market, I think the only way to do that is to drastically bring that, that price well, down to you know the price. Because Josh, I quoted this price uh, last time I was on your show, but according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, 1935, the year before the 1936 Marijuana Stamp Act, a pound of Indian hemp weed, which is what they called it then, and they sure as shit weren't cultivating the THC out of the hemp, was 37 cents a pound, right? So, you know, I use, this is some major market elasticity that's going to snap back with regard to pricing. So to me, when more and more producers get involved and finally the big boys and the pharma and the big ag giants, like there's a time and a place for that kind of production. But for the smokable cannabis that, you know, you're going to want to use for the purposes when you generally think of cannabis beyond medical use, right? The craft grower is going to be producing bud quality of which the finished products for like, you know, natural derivative products like keeps, hashes, different waxes and so on. You're not going to be able to shortcut that right mm -hmm. by you know growing and producing thc in a vat for example so to me the price of cannabis is what it has been through history it's only been the last 97 years and but for the past 97 years of drug war prohibition we'd all probably be growing cannabis or large segments of society would so you know to me i think you know the government is desperately trying to make it difficult for us going back to how we were doing things 97 years ago.
Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Do you know uh, if it was 37 cents a pound for cannabis, do you know what it was equivalent for tobacco? Because I'm looking at tobacco right now at around $20 a pound. I'm thinking cannabis has to come down and match that. Do you know what it was back then? If you're different product. Probably why, way why, higher. Why, why, why do we have to get to the tobacco level? Because that's a, that's, I'm it's looking imperative. at, I'm, I'm looking at a comparable agricultural commodity with similar um, harvesting techniques and, and requirements to compare the price, not, not the demand or anything other than. Oh, yeah. The, the it would be interesting required. to see like what a pound of tobacco, if that's even how they were measuring it. Right versus the pound of Indian hemp weed. But nonetheless, uh, I bet the tobacco would have been way higher in terms of the value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't compare it to like a, a non-vice, like a cabbage, because the vice is what kind of puts that Corn. price. It, it's like if you go in and, and price a piece of rope, it's going to be cheap. But if you buy a piece of rope for a dog, 10x, you know, the price could be that much more. If you put a vice on something, the price is that much more. So that's kind of why I wanted to compare those prices just to see where we would be at. But eventually, I think we're going to have prices come way down to kind of get that illicit market out and have some kind of home grow that has that nose You have to follow that nose and, and get that funk and flavor back. But I don't think that home grow or crack grow is going to come until we have, um, you know, a massive amount of, of big cannabis and then from the ashes of that will rise something that people actually want to consume um, but that strategy but that strategy of um the, the strategy of trying to screw down the market so they screw the price down so that the illicit market will go away i i'm not sure if that is going to succeed and certainly the idea of trying to make the illicit market go away almost anywhere has been a total failure for the last hundred years so uh i i, I don't know <laughs> it, it won't be from prices coming down. It'll be from competition from markets like Peru and Colombia and Chile that are already doing it at five cents per gram right. locally. It'll be 15 cents with landing costs. When that happens, everyone right. will have to readjust. But hold on. Let me give you that example of where I've always been a little bit cautionary about that. Because like you take that $5 bottle of Cuban rum that Canadians can buy in Veradero. Right. But that same five dollar bottle of rum that you buy from the B.C. liquor store or private liquor retail is going to run you anywhere from like fifty five to seventy dollars. Right. So why Canada tends to do really well is we have a thing called protectionary tariffs, which got under Trump's skin quite a bit in the NAFTA renegotiations with Canada. As you can all remember, they got into quite the pissing contest. But to me, I think that's going to end up that cheap weed from Jamaica or that Mexican weed or weed from Honduras. Right. I mean, unless it's absolutely stellar, it's still going to have an uphill battle comparative to domestic American produced cannabis in this, those legal states and in Canada. So on one hand, sure, it might drive the industry or, or keep prices, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I think it's good weed will always be bespoken for. Yeah. Before it's grown really and out of the that. ground, basically. Yep. Yeah. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I, I know that it's going to happen. I think home grow is going to be driven by the nose. That's what people want. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that, that whole segment and seeing that as yet to really kind of develop, but I'm looking forward to it nonetheless. Um, but I think with that, we're going to have to roll this one up. So Christopher Smith, you are with, you're with the American Cannabis Report. Where can people find you at? AmericanCannabisReport.com. That's my website. I also do some interviews here with Pro Cannabis Media, and we uh, work together on that, have a collaboration. Um, and so uh, we can find those uh, on all the places that Pro Cannabis Media uh, puts its podcasts, YouTube, etc. cetera. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Yes. And then, Robert Lower, you're with uh, Ad Lusum Law. Uh, if people aren't in Canada banging down your door, when can they find you at? There it is. That's my, I think we're backwards, but nonetheless, that's the logo. Ad Lusum Law Corporation. You can reach me at www.adlusumlaw.com. A for Alpha, D for Delta, L for Lima, U for Uniform, C for Charlie, E for Echo, M for Mother, law.com. Or you want to go old school, my direct cell is 1604 218 1084. 
feel free to give me a holler if you want to talk cannabis law or are looking uh looking for counsel to guide you through your cannabis ventures would be happy to talk he loves calls at 4 20 in the morning too so call him really really early uh, i'm josh kincaid i'm and with i the will talk. forward them on to joshua kincaid <laughs> uh, touche all right i'm josh kincaid from the talking hedge this has been green rush uh, come back every Friday live from four to six. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.